Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, over-the-air affiliates, Sirius XM 156, via podcast or video streaming on Twitch and YouTube. I'd just like to say thank you for spending a little time with me today. If you're in the States, hopefully you're having a great Juneteenth Day weekend and Father's Day weekend. If you're taking a break from the cookout music to join me today, extra special thanks. If I really would have planned this out better, I would have had like Jazzy Jeff and Rob Bass and some other things pulled for bumper music. You can tell how old I am, but I didn't plan on talking about any of that today. I planned on talking about wrestling news. And there's a lot of it to get into today on the program. In case you have not heard, uh, in the midst of being investigated by his own board of directors, Vince McMahon made his appearance on Friday night's SmackDown, and we'll get into that whole spectacle when we get back from break. But a little bit of sad news to start the show with, right on the heels of longtime referee and agent Dave Hepner's passing away last week. On Sunday, it was announced that former WWE referee and agent Tim White passed Passed away at the age of 86. White was with uh, WWE from 1985 until 2009 and refereed some of the biggest matches in company history, including the infamous Mankind Undertaker Hell in a Cell. Although his side jobs were almost just as famous as his refereeing, uh, before becoming a full-time ref for the company, he worked as Andre the Giant's agent and appears in many of the documentaries about Andre. And he also owned a little bar called The Friendly Tap in Cumberland, Rhode Island. And anytime WWE was anywhere near Rhode Island, they would go into that bar and completely wreck shop, especially if the APA was around. Lots of news to get into, including Sonny's lawyer quitting, ratings, AEW, New Japan, and a whole lot more. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. It's like the cookout. Welcome back to the show, Mike Sempervivi, Wrestling Observer Live. Producer Dom coming through. Producer Dom also working this holiday weekend. Hopefully, if you are, we can give you a little bit of a, a mental break away from that. Hopefully you don't hear that and immediately think of Joe Budden, whose podcast has kind of ruined that song for a lot of people. That the song they play on Joe Budden. No, it's the Gap Band's Outstanding. For Christ's sakes. I'm old, though. Hey, we do this show here for an hour at a time, but if you want to try to get us 24-7, and sometimes I'm awake 24-7, which leads to situations that I'm in right now, a little bit loopy, at Sempervivi on Twitter. The timeline for this show is at WONF4W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid Atlantic Pod. Brian Alvarez will be back tomorrow. In fact, he'll be back today, I believe, with to Filthy Tom Lawler, uh, who's got a lot to talk about, frankly, right now. Uh, and if he's not back for that, he will certainly be for subscribers. Uh, after Raw tonight with Dave Meltzer, Wrestling Observer Radio, his Twitter is at Brian Alvarez. And we'll just get right into it. We have legal news today. It's not Vince McMahon's. It is Tammy Sitch's. Her lawyer has asked the court to withdraw him as legal representation. It was almost good English right there. According to PW Insider, as is written up here at the uh, F4WOnline.com front page, Stephen De La Roche filed the motion on June 16th. He noted the following in his filing. One, an impasse has been reached in the handling of the case, making it impossible for the client and attorney to continue to work cooperatively on the case. Sonny can't get along with anybody. Uh, number two, the client has not complied with the terms of the employment agreement with this attorney. Not surprising there. And number three, the client will not be prejudiced if the undersigned is permitted to withdraw. So 
There you go. Tammy Sitch has been charged with one count of DUI manslaughter, one count of causing death while operating a vehicle with a suspended license, three counts of DUI causing property damage, and four counts of DUI causing personal injury. The charges stem from an incident on March 25th when a vehicle driven by Sitch crashed into the back of another vehicle that was stopped at a traffic light. The driver of the other vehicle, 75-year-old Julian Lassiter, died from injuries sustained in the collision. Sitch has pleaded not guilty to all charges and hearing held on June 1st. She has been in jail since having her bond revoked on May 13th. There are also civil filings already by the Lassiter family as well. So that is the latest in the update on Tammy Sitch's situation, which continues to grow darker by the day. No word at all about Vince McMahon's situation as we come on the air with you today. Vince, under investigation from his own board of directors, appeared as advertised on Friday night's SmackDown Live on Fox. Came strutting out to his theme music as Mr. McMahon. Gave a little... uh, little gunshot over there to the, uh, the, the, the lady announcer. I, I can't remember who the, what the announcer's name is, but, but she did his announcing, and he grabs the mic from her, and, and, and there it is. We, we finally get to hear from Vince McMahon. What is Mi- Mr. McMahon going to say? And he just says, It's a privilege, as always, to stand before you here tonight, the WWE Universe. Especially privileged to be standing here in this ring in Minnesota. Why that would be anything extra special? Because he killed Vern to really hotshot his company so many years back. I, I don't know. But he said, I'm simply here to remind you of the four words we just saw in what we call the WWE signature. Those four words, then, now, forever. And the most important word is together. Welcome to SmackDown. And he throws the mic and with arms flapping, goes up the ramp and goes to the back. And that's that. And the bottom line is the show in fast overnights. And we'll have more of of the details of this coming out today. It averaged 2.272 million viewers. The previous week's SmackDown ended up with a final average of 1.914 So a similar increase would put this show in the 2.4 to 2.5 million range when final numbers are released at some point today. The Fast Nationals showed something else that's very important to point out. 2.186 million in the first hour, 2.362 in the second hour. Not only did they, they stick around from the first hour to see what Vince had to say, But they also stuck around to watch Roman Reigns defend that World Heavyweight Championship against Matt Riddle. So this is going to be SmackDown's best rating probably since May of last year. So that's certainly uh, something. I mean, what did we learn? Nothing at all. You know, Mr. McMahon and, and Roman Reigns are big universe stars. We already knew that. I guess if you want to look at this from a a very short term and small uh, perspective in in Vince, I I guess you could say in some ways he kind of won. If you're especially a Vince supporter, uh, you know, you have an investigation like this going on. The WWE releases a press release early in the morning, crack of dawn on Friday, saying he's temporarily stepping aside, that Stephanie is going to fill in. Then a short time after that, they issue another press release saying that Mr. McMahon is going to appear on SmackDown. And from there, it got everyone talking about what he, Vince McMahon, was going to do as his wrestling persona, Mr. McMahon, which is based on his real persona. And that was it. So we got Defiant Vince being as defiant as he could possibly be in these times. And it got people to tune in. And to their credit, they kept those people. And when those people got to the end, they got the gift of Brock Lesnar. (laughs) Now, whether that's a gift of the same socks that you got last year from your aunt or whether it's, you know, a a gift that you've been waiting for since there's been no Charlotte and we're not going to have Randy and we're not going to have Cody and all that sort of stuff. 
you know, that that's to be determined. But when it comes to the WWE stock, you know, last week before the Wall Street Journal story broke, it hit a near 52-week high of 68.50. And I will look right now. It's at 62.51. So the stock's value is down 3.6% for the day, but it's still up 2.6% for the month. It's up 30% over the last three months. And it's over 200% uh, increased over the last five years, which for a lot of people interested in WWE's business affairs, that's the only, only thing that they're worried about. And if Vince can get away with this from a, a big slap on the hand and, and nothing too damaging is released in those NDAs, and that's certainly to be determined yet. But if he can get away with this with a slap on the wrist and a stern warning that if anything like this ever comes out and happens again, that you are gone, he might be able just to skate away with this because they've got these billion-dollar deals, and he brought on Nick Khan, and the formula's working. Look at what we're doing, pal. Pals. We'll see. We'll see. As far as the show itself went from the entertainment portion of the proceedings, Roman Reigns, Matt Riddle, undisputed title in a match that Riddle dedicated to Randy Orton with the stipulation that he can never face Reigns again if he lost. He lost. <laughs> good match. Good crowd. Near fall near the end when uh, Reigns went for the spear, but Riddle hit the RKO. That was fantastic. Riddle then went for the floating bro, hit it, but then tried another RKO instead of going for the pin. Reigns pushed him off. Riddle tried to springboard off the ropes, but Reigns caught him with another spear for the pin. After the match, Reigns grabbed the mic, immediately said there's no one left, said he told everyone two years ago he'd wreck everyone and leave, and that's exactly what he's doing now that Riddle's done. Said he's out, told the crowd to acknowledge him, and began to leave when Cowboy Brock's music hit. And they were in Minnesota, so those people were amped. They faced off. Brock smiled, took off his hat, extended his hand to Roman. Roman didn't want to take it. But then, you know what? He said, hey, why not? And he went ahead and he went to shake Brock's hand. And Brock picked him up and F5'd him, <laughs> killed him. The crowd went nuts. The Usos ran in the ring. He killed them as well, too. And there Brock Lesnar was, standing tall at the end of the show. So how will this play into Raw tonight? We don't know yet. I'm sure it's going to be talked about, but we have a couple of things planned, which we'll get into when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Show Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Holiday weekend, Juneteenth, Father's Day weekend. Only one early baseball game on a Monday. The New York Mets lead the Miami Marlins 4-0, bottom of the six. I don't know if hockey is going to play any... Uh, Havoc on Raw tonight, I would tend to doubt it. WWE fans tend to be WWE fans no matter what, but uh, the Colorado Avalanche with a 2-0 lead on the Tampa Bay Lightning, they may have played into AEW's ratings last Wednesday, but we'll we'll get to that here in a, in a little bit. I got to first open up this Red Bull because I didn't do that for the ASMR kids yet. There you go. A couple more things to get into that uh, from SmackDown on Friday, and if you want Brian's thoughts about this, he is going to be talking about them for sure with Brian with uh, on the Brian and Vinny show as well with Filthy Tom Lawler. Uh, a couple of things. First and foremost, for me personally, Kyle, Kayla Braxton's interactions with Sami Zayn have successfully replaced her banter with Paul Heyman, which was always one of the small victories of SmackDown, no matter what else happened on that show. Like, them going back and forth, it, it was always great, and I think Sami Zayn and her doing it is fantastic as well. Uh, we had a segment with uh, Sheamus, Drew McIntyre, and Adam Pierce where Pierce announced that Sheamus was in the Money in the Bank ladder match, and, of course, Sheamus immediately cut Pierce off and started rubbing that into Drew McIntyre who sent him over the top rope. Pierce then said, well, now that he can continue, McIntyre is in the match as well. So that's that. In the women's Money in the Bank qualifier, Raquel Rodriguez defeated Shayna Baszler in three minutes to join Alexa Bliss, Liv Morgan, and Lacey Evans, who was on commentary uh, as qualifiers for that latter match. After he lost again to Madcap Moss, Baron Corbin challenged Pat McAfee, reminding him that he once called him bum-ass Corbin and said that he was undeserving of pyro. 
both things fair. Uh, to be honest, I don't want to get blocked like Brian is, but I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, says if he doesn't watch himself that uh, he's going to kick McAfee's ass. And McAfee, being a former NFL player and a Trip Rogers train professional wrestler as well, then said, uh, okay, I'll call your bluff on this. And then led the, the crowd into laughing at Corbin uh, right as he slunk to the back as the New Day walked by and came out for their match against Jinder Mahal and Shanky. And bottom line of this match is every time Xavier plays his trombone, Shanky just, he just gets that feeling. And, and it just starts moving through his body. And he can't control himself. He can't help himself. He's got to move. He's got to dance. So we get the shaken of Shanky that Brian calls Shankly. So we've got Shaky Shankly, who should be Shanky, but Brian calls him Shaky or whatever it is. But he's dancing now. And that upset Jinder Mahal. They lose the match. You know what? Out of everybody, Satnam Singh, uh, just by existing in AEW, is looking better and better when it comes to who might be the one to help take over the Indian audience. Uh, but <laughs> Ludwig Kaiser announced on behalf of Gunter that the Intercontinental Championship will never again be held by an American. I'm fine with that. Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, anybody else, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Natalia makes says she can make Ronda Rousey tap. I don't believe that's going to be the case, and uh, I don't believe there's going to be anything that happens in the buildup for their match that's going to make me believe that Natalia is going to get the victory. Max Dupree uh, is announced with the, a spotlight over the ring, but then we go to the back where the former L.A. Knight is running down Adam Pierce for not having top flight acoustics and, and lighting. Uh, the type that titillates the juices of your guilty pleasure. Those were his words, not mine. Also, the Viking Raiders are going to appear and re-debut on SmackDown next week. So that's what you missed on SmackDown. That is what Brian and Tom are going to be talking about in a lot more hilarious way than, than I just did it there. Uh, WWE, back to TV. Raw tonight, Pinnacle Bank Arena on the campus of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska. Becky Lynch takes on Asuka in a Money in the Bank qualifying match. And I will read directly from what WWE wrote about this on their website. The WWE Universe will once again walk with Elias as Ezekiel's older brother returns to perform one more concert with certain WWE superstars still under the impression that Ezekiel is Elias. The WWE rookie intends to put the controversy to rest once and for all when he stands side by side side by side with his brother in the ring. Will the two brothers put on a concert of a lifetime? Or will a skeptical Kevin Owens interrupt the reunion? Find out Monday night on Raw. Now, did they tip their hand here? In one, in one sentence there, they seem to be promising that we will see Elias and Ezekiel arm in arm, kind of waving back and forth singing one of Elias's hit songs, of which I can't remember a, a single one of them. But they're going to walk together. They're going to talk together. They're going to sing together. At least they're going to plan to do that. But will Kevin Owens do something before any of this takes place, like complete Roadrunner, Wile E. Coyote style that just screws everything up so we don't even get it? Like We, we don't even get like a, a, we just get a slight tease of it. Or will they go through and actually do the special effects? Will we have the hologram? Will we have something instead of just Ezekiel in a, a, a beard that happens to be glued on or something like that? Or is there really a, a twin brother out there? I mean, let's be honest here. There could be. You guys didn't really know all those angles were floating around out there until they appeared on the show. At least the, the any that really looked like Kurt, did you? For those people that remember those, all those angles, Eric and whatnot from the Attitude days? I don't know. 
But uh, that's all they have planned so far for tonight. Uh, I also watched AEW Rampage as well. That was taped last Wednesday after Dynamite. Do- uh, John Moxley opened up the show defeating Dante Martin in a good match. Tony then interviewed Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland about their team when they're interrupted by powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks, who remind Lee and Swerve they keep losing to him. So that feud is going to continue. Got a pretty good video package of the House of Black and the Death Triangle cutting promos on each other. And it was Max Caster who did get a little bit of a rap off and was able to, in one of his bars, make a reference to an NDA. Uh, he and the Gun Club defeated Leon Ruffin in Bear Country, who were named Ruffin It. I don't know why that made me laugh. One of those small things. Dan Housen then cut a promo for Hook about facing a New Japan Dojo member. So that's going to be interesting to see who they take for that. And if we get a series of these things, because I would love that. And I think it would be great for Hook's career if he does get to have some experience working with New Japan Dojo guys. Maybe meets uh, Shibata. That would be that would be good and very good for his future. Jay Cargill. In the main event, defeated uh, Willow Nightingale to retain the TBS title and raise her record to 33. And oh, I see, I take that back. This this was the semi-main event. Uh, Stokely Hathaway was on commentary. He had to try to fight to get in words with Chris Jericho being up there. Felt like a lot of this match actually happened during the commercial breaks, but uh, Jade got the win afterwards. Kira Hogan got in the ring, started helping Jade beat Willow down when Athena appeared, followed by Chris Statlander, who chased the heels from the ring. And then a video package aired of Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh, and Sanjay Dutt talking about Samoa Joe in the main event of Darby Allen against Bobby Fish. And one thing you can say about Darby Allen, much like uh, the Creed brothers, they make everything look believable. I believe it hurts. I believe it hurts for real. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not with the Creed brothers. You cringe a little bit more because they're rookies and, oh, God, you know, positioning matters and inexperience matters. When it comes to Darby, it's just everything he does. It's like being shot out of a cannon. And, you know, one of the things about dives for years, people have said it takes so much time to set up. You do lose, you know, when you're really into something, sometimes you you do lose uh, being in the moment when somebody is setting up a bunch of moves or springboards or something like that with Darby Allen, you almost never have to worry about that because everything he does, you know, he's, he's, he, he just does it to the nth degree and has no problems putting his body on the line. So heck of a main event. He ends up defeating uh, Bobby Fish. And then ultimately afterwards, Bobby Fish calls out Kyle O'Reilly with a chair. They try to do some damage to him, but the lights go out. When they come back up, of course, it is Sting who helps chase off Kyle O'Reilly. Then uh, Darby Allen got the chair, put it around Bobby Fish's ankle, did a coffin drop off the top rope after the match, which uh, pilmanized his leg, and that was that. The show went off the air. We'll see how it does in the ratings. It hasn't been doing too good. Dynamite last Wednesday on TBS. Not good. I mean, it, this was disappointing. It had to be 761,000 viewers on average. You know, I think when, when it really started, if you said if they could get between 750 and a, and a million, boy, that would be really great. And then they started high. They dribbled down a little bit. But then it got to the point where it's like if they're doing between 900 and a million, then everything is OK. 761,000, that's tough, down almost 20% from the week before. Did the Stanley Cup Finals have anything to do with that? They got a a far higher rating than a lot of people thought it was going to, so I don't know if that was it or not, but we've got a lot more to get into when we get back from break, including news out of New Japan that's got a lot of effects on AEW moving forward. Wrestling Observer Live. Wrestling Observer Live, Mike Sempervivi here with you. I do not believe there's going to be a Brian Alvarez filthy Tom Waller filthy for daily today. So the next time you hear Brian will be overnight or tomorrow morning. However, uh, whatever time zone you're in wrestling observer radio, wrapping up everything taking place tonight during Monday night, raw, including any news bits Dave has picked up over the weekend about the Vince McMahon story or any other stories floating out there, including Sasha Banks, who uh, still, as of this moment, is in limbo right now. 
There's been no uh, news on Naomi moving whatsoever. And ever since Raj Geary released the news that Sasha was being released, uh, there's been a standstill right now. Nobody can confirm anything uh, other than she apparently is still on the inactive portion of the daily roster that WWE has. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. One thing is for sure, you're not going to be seeing her coming back. I just, I can't fathom that happening but uh we shall see uh one thing you will never see apparently is new japan and cmll working well with triple a and aw's andrade el idolo says he was suspended or suspended said he was supposed to face will osprey at forbidden door but the match was changed for political reasons that is the reason we are going to get orange cassidy and will osprey will osprey and andrade seem to make a lot more sense Andrade appeared on Hugo Savinovich's Lucha Libre interview uh, show Friday and said that he was set to fly to Japan to shoot the angle for the match with Osprey, but then plans changed, and uh, credit to Lucha Blog for the translation here. This story also, as many stories are, up at F4WOnline.com, put up there by Joseph Courier, put up there by Brian Rose, Josh Nason, and all the other hardworking people over at the website. Uh, but here it is. The translation says that the change is a result of the complicated political situation involving New Japan's alliance with CMLL as AEW has a working relationship with Mexico's AAA promotion. Andrade worked one match for AAA in 2021 and one match so far this year, last appearing at Triple Mania in Monterey on April 30th. The, in the interview with Savinovich, Andrade also expressed frustration with AAA as he says they have not booked him as they said they had would, leading to a situation where he cannot work for New Japan due to that relationship. So there you go. Andrade says he was scheduled to be on this weekend's Triple Mania show, but that that booking was canceled. So high drama always taking place. Uh, Andrade, bottom line is, is... Andrade won't be on Forbidden Door, and Will Ospreay and, and Orange Cassidy will be. There was a winner-takes-all ROH uh, IWGP World Tag Team Championship match that's been added to Forbidden Door, which you probably already know by now. FTR, the ROH Tag Team Champions, the IWGP Tag Team Champions, the great Ocon and Jeff Cobb, will face off against Rapongi Vice, Trent Beretta, and Rocky Romero in a triple threat match at Forbidden Door with both sets of titles on the line. As of now, there are six matches announced for the show. Everybody is waiting on that seventh match to be announced. And when I say that, it is not the IWGP heavyweight champion uh, chip match. That Sure, if that gets added, that's fine. Everybody wants Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. We still don't know if Brian Danielson has been cleared yet. Dave and Brian this morning for subscribers of Wrestling Observer Radio uh, indicated that he was not, but we'll have to see what the week brings. There are six matches so far. John Moxley and Hiroshi Tanahashi for the interim AEW World Championship, the women's world title, Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm, the U.S. title for the IWGP U.S. title, Will Ospreay and Orange Cassidy, the All-Atlantic Championship, and that is starting to come into focus here which we'll get to in a moment. Miro and Pac are the only people so far uh, that, that are in the match from AEW side. We are closer to having a New Japan representative. Uh, and then a fourth person is going to be added down the line. There's also a ROH, as I mentioned, the World Tag Team Championship match with the IWGP tag titles. And then a six-man between Chris Jericho, Minoru Suzuki, and Sammy Guevara against Eddie Kingston, Wheeler Yuta, and Shota Umino, so no idea how large this card is going to be. Uh, less, maybe more. You know, three matches added, four matches added. That probably should be good. I'm hoping it's some more singles matches. 
Probably will not be in the case of the IWGP Heavyweight Championship match. It's nothing against Adam Cole, and I know there's Adam Cole's always uh, up for banter, or his name is always up for some sort of banter, whether it be about his body or how he's been booked or this, that, and the third. But I was hoping to have a one-on-one match. I can understand why they're not, but I, I really would have preferred that. Obviously, if we get Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr., that's another one. But I hope there's a couple of more singles matches as well. Probably won't be. Uh, I have a feeling if we get more matches added, uh, it's probably going to be heavier on the multiple person side of things. So we shall see. It's also been announced that Thunder Rosa is going to be going to Tokyo Joshi Pro uh, to go ply her trade over there. Tony Storm, you know, it's interesting. If she gets the win here... Rosa can still go to Tokyo Joshi Pro, and man, I'd like to see Tony Storm in stardom again. You know, I'd like to see some sort of scenario there uh, at at some point down the line. Obviously, stardom's got that one championship where it's only defended against foreigners, so that's something, the SWA championship, so that is something that people that are clamoring to see stardom talent come over to the country and are looking to see some interaction between AEW wrestlers and stardom. I mean, that's a certainly a place where, you know, Something can certainly happen over that championship. So we'll have to see how things go. This Wednesday's Go Home Dynamite, they've announced some things, including John Moxley teaming with Hiroshi Tanahashi against Chris Jericho and Lance Archer. So that's a, a pretty good match right there. This past Wednesday, of course, Jericho and the Jericho Appreciation Society uh, interrupted Moxley and Tanahashi's uh, face-to-face, and eventually Archer joined in and Desperado of Suzuki Goon, which led to Jericho then then announcing the six man that was going to be taking place at Forbidden Door. So Will Ospreay and Aussie Open will face off against Orange Cassidy and Rapongi Vice, and then a all Atlantic Championship eliminator between Penta Oscuro. Does anybody call him that? It's still Pentagon against Malachi Black. And off of the All Atlantic Championship eliminator match between Penta and Malachi. I shall transition over to Monday's, today's, New Japan Roadshow, which took place in Tokyo. Generated some news there. Both Tomohiro Ishii and Clark Connors have advanced to the AEW All-Atlantic Championship match, which will take place, qualifying match, which will take place tomorrow at another New Japan Roadshow. So, I mean, look, we've got Miro. We've got Pac. Miro facing off against the she is the only thing that makes sense here to me. Now, you could definitely give Connors an upset win over Ishii and springboard him into the match, and he could be the guy that takes the fall, but it would still be a big deal. I just, no, no, don't do that. Everybody wants to see Ishii in this thing. I would have liked to just see a tournament or something where this whole thing came down to Miro and she, I think that would have been a pretty hype match to have at forbidden door, pretty awesome one-on-one match to have, but they want to go with multiple countries in there for the, the, the belt with the multiple flags on it, the all Atlantic championship. So that's that from there, but there's also a, a little bit more news as United Empire as Will Ospreay and the Great O'Con and Jeff Cobb are stomping around here, as well as Aussie Open, their junior heavyweight uh, uh, partners of TJP and Francesco Akira won the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championship on this same show this morning when Akira pinned Master Wato. Uh, they defeated Ma- uh, Wato and Raisuke Taguchi, who've held the title since February. Uh, with the win, Akira becomes the first Italian born champion in IWGP history. And uh, wrestling, uh, New Japan in Italy, they always had a pocket of fans in Italy. And at times new Japan was incredibly popular there during the tiger mask years. That was the case. And then it kind of had a revival. And when tiger mask four started becoming a thing in new Japan, he became popular over there as well too. Jushin Liger was always popular over there as well. So Francesco Akira becomes the first ever Italian born 
IWGP champion. Uh, he made his debut in uh, this year's Best of the Super Juniors alongside Wheeler, Utah, and, and, and Ace Austin and Alex Zane and a couple other people. And I tell you, I think people are going to be looking back at this past IWGP uh, or this past Best of the Super Juniors, and I think history is going to be very, very kind to it. Again, there was not a whole lot of hype going into it. But once it got going, there was a little bit of a sluggish start, I think. But the fans of Japan took to almost everybody. All of the, the new people that were appearing, they seemed to take to really well. The matches got better and better as it went on. There were some great performances by Desperado. There was great performances by El Fantasmo, including all the teases that put him in this year's G1 and... I will use that as a transition. Look at me today on the holiday weekend, just looping things together here. I'll take that as my uh, chance to talk about the fact that the four blocks of next month's G1 Climax 32 tournament have been announced. So how this is going to work this year, there's going to be four blocks with seven wrestlers in it each. The winners of each block are then going to advance to one-on-one matches on August 17th, normal bracketing, two semifinals matches, and the the winners of those will move on to August 18th at Tokyo's Budokan Hall. The A block. This is the block that matters, at least here on this website, at least here in my heart. The A block. This is the block of death. Kazuchika Okada, Toru Yano, I know what you're saying, wait, what, what, Jeff Cobb, Jonah, Bad Luck Fale, and you're saying, Mike, Bad Luck Fale, all large men there, imagine having to face Bad Luck Fale after facing Jeff Cobb and Jonah, and then staring down the battle of Lan- the, the barrel of Lance Archer. But most importantly, filthy Tom Lawler. He gets multiple dreams coming true, as well as I. He gets to face Toru Yano, and he gets to face Kazuchika Okada. And we get to see him mix it up against some other foreigners who are the future of New Japan Gaijin. Jeff Cobb, Jonah. The old school with Lance Archer. That's a hell of a, a, a hell of a block. B block, Jay White, Ishii, Sonata, Tonga, Great Okan, Chase Owens, Taichi. C block, Tanahashi, Goto, Naito, Zack Sabre Jr., Aaron Hanare, Kenta and Evil. D block, Will Ospreay, Yoshihashi, Shingo Takagi, David Finley, Juice Robinson, El Fantasmo, and Yujiro Takahashi. So this whole thing is going to kick off July 16th. The winner of the tournament will receive a briefcase with a contract in it for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship match coming up in January at Russell Kingdom. Soothing sounds on the way out to break. You're almost back to the cookout, folks. We'll get you there. I'll be your bridge. Wrestling Observer Live. For me, be back with your Wrestling Observer Live. If you could only hear some of the things that producer Don will say during break, you wouldn't want to know. Uh, but we do now know that one of Vince McMahon's legal issues is out of the way. If you go to the front page of WrestlingObserver.com, it has been posted since this show has began that Vince McMahon and Oliver Luck are not headed to trial after all. As was first reported by the Sports Business Journal on Monday, McMahon and Luck have reached a settlement in Luck's wrongful termination suit. Luck, who was the commissioner of McMahon's 2020 XFL revival, was seeking approximately $24 million, I believe it was $23.8 million in compensation that he was still owed from Vince McMahon. The financial terms of the settlement have not been disclosed. They must have signed an NDA. The parties reached an agreement to resolve this case today. Lux attorney Paul Dabrowski wrote in a filing last Friday 
Vincent, well, good. Vince at least wanted to tie something up last Friday. Uh, Dabrowski was seeking a judicial order to permanently seal records in the case. Luck's contract as XFL commissioner was personally guaranteed by McMahon. He was fired just days before the XFL folded amid the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. McMahon claimed that he fired Luck due to gross neglect of his job during the pandemic, personal use of a league-assisted cell phone, and signing wide receiver Antonio Callaway, despite Callaway having legal issues uh, Luck has said that there was no policy in place when he signed Callaway, and anything about the cell phone went right out the window when a judge ruled that none of it was admissible. So Luck sued, McMahon countersued, and here we are. A settlement conference took place last Wednesday. It only lasted nine minutes. They were done, but... Apparently, last Friday's other news sparked Vince into maybe thinking, I don't want to go to trial with these guys in July. There you go, everybody. Thank you, Producer Dom. Thank you to everybody out there listening and watching this broadcast. My name is Mike Sempervivi. We shall talk to you again after a while. <laughs>